This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Fields of Despair. Fields of Despair was released in 2017 by GMT Games and designed by Kurt Lewis Keckley. This game supports up to two players and takes about three hours to play. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules Breakdown for Fields of Despair. In this episode, we will continue setting up the game using Scenario 1 from the playbook. For our next section, we will need the global setup table at the bottom of page 10. The global setup table is going to be used for the numerous tracks on the right side of the game board. I'm going to set up the global section of the game board following the sequence of play. The first step of the sequence of play is to advance the Turn and USA entry marker. The Turn marker setup information can be found at the bottom of the global setup table. Scenario 1 begins on Phase 1. The AP1 stands for Action Phase 1. Remember, each turn is divided into two spaces, one for each action phase. Now, as for turn markers, each marker is double-sided. One side shows turn and the other side turn with initiative. The global setup table shows that the central powers begins the scenario with the initiative. So place the CP turn marker on the first phase of turn one with the initiative side up. Later in the production phase, players will be able to bid for initiative. After that, it's time to set up the USA entry track. Place the green US entry marker on space one. When this marker lands on the final space, the U.S. will enter the war. This marker, like the turn marker in step one of the sequence of play, will advance every turn. In a moment, we'll learn more about how naval warfare can advance this marker even further. And yes, for those of you plotting ahead, most likely the introductory scenario will end before the U.S. get a chance to enter the war. However, managing all the steps in the sequence of play is good practice for playing all the scenarios. The next step in the sequence of play is to resolve the Eastern Front. The sections to set up for this step are the General Information Track and the Eastern Front Panel. This requires a special marker for each section. The Gold EF Track Marker is used for the Eastern Front Panel. Referencing the Global Setup Table, place this marker on Space 1. The second marker is a Great Eastern Front marker. Although it's a little confusing, this marker actually belongs on the General Information track. The position to place this marker is not shown on the Global Setup table. It's instead shown at the bottom of the Central Powers Main Board Setup table. For the introductory scenario, place the Central Powers marker on Space 15. Now that we've cleared that up, let's learn how the Eastern Front functions. Fields of Despair's main focus is the war in Western Europe. However, a significant number of the Central Powers Army is allocated to fighting Russia on the Eastern Front. For this game, the Eastern Front is abstracted into a minigame. The strength of the Central Powers Army is represented by the Eastern Front marker. The introductory scenario sets this marker at 15. Think of this marker as an imaginary 15 strength block. Whenever this marker is reduced on the track, the Central Powers Army on the Eastern Front is taking losses. On subsequent turns, reinforces will be added to this number, so the Eastern Front can never be wiped out. However, be aware, the war on the Eastern Front cannot be won, it can only be survived. The turn track at the bottom of the Eastern Front panel shows the duration of the war from 1914 until the fall of the Tsar and the Bolshevik Revolution. Therefore, the Central Powers player must work to ensure as many of these soldiers as possible can survive to return to the Western Front as reinforcements on turn 7. The Central Powers Army assigned to the Eastern Front may be reduced due to battles every turn. These battles are managed by the types of colored cubes pulled from the red draw bag. In the introductory scenario, four red cubes and four black cubes are added to the draw bag. Red cubes signify a Russian victory. 
Black cubes represent a central power's victory. When the marker advances on the track, more red cubes are added to the bag, thus increasing the odds of pulling a Russian victory result. During the production phase, the Central Powers player may spend economic points to add more black cubes to the bag to improve their chances. Now that you understand the background, let's go through the steps for resolving the Eastern Front in an actual game. First, the Central Powers player advances the EF track marker one space and then adds the number of red cubes indicated to the red draw bag. In this example, we'd add two red cubes to the bag. Next, the Central Powers player reaches into the draw bag and pulls out three cubes. For every red cube drawn, the Central Powers player rolls a six-sided die and then consults the Eastern Front loss table. This will tell the player the severity of losses to apply to the Eastern Front marker. I'm showing the most severe results, so you would reduce the Eastern Front marker by 7 strength points. Now, another important point is that when three red cubes are drawn, this is considered a major Russian victory. One of those red cubes is placed on a major Russian victory space. There are three of them. All the other cubes are returned to the draw bag. Now, if all three of these spaces are occupied with a red cube, then the game is over and the Central Powers player loses. This is a penalty for the Central Powers player to take this seriously and pay attention to the Eastern Front. This Eastern Front mechanic continues until either three major Russian victories and the CP Powers lose the game, or the EF track marker reaches space 7 for the fall of the Tsar and the Bolshevik Revolution. At the start of the next reorganization phase, the surviving strength points on the general information track are converted into blocks and can be placed in any friendly contested or friendly controlled frontline hexes. Next up in the sequence of play is the production phase. In this phase, players place new blocks in the map and use their economic points to produce other assets of war. The production phase has its own sequence of seven short steps. Let's begin with step one, economic maintenance. The assets of both powers are in a constant state of decline. This will require them to make adjustments on their player boards. Let's see how that works. Each player will reduce the markers on the following tracks by one space. The artillery maintenance track, the air maintenance track, and finally the supply capacity track. There is one exception. If the supply capacity track is above 20, it is reduced by two spaces until it is below 20 again. The next step in the production phase is manpower deployment and attrition. To complete this step, we need to head back to the Scenario 1 setup pages in the playbook. For this part, we will need the Economy and Reinforcements table midway down page 10. Now, let's compare the information in this table to the game map. The Economy and Reinforcements table shows two statistics. Economic points awarded per turn, which we will talk about in just a moment, and the reinforcement strength points that each side receives. To field these reinforcements, players must use the blocks available in their force pool. Then those blocks may only be placed at a nation's deployment hex. For the Central Powers on the Western Front, this is at Koblenz. The Central Powers also have reinforcements for the Eastern Front. These points adjust the Eastern Front marker on the General Records track. For the Allied Powers, French blocks are deployed in Paris. For British blocks, England. You also regarding Allied reinforcements, the USA may not enter the war until later turns in the game. These late war scenarios include a USA deployment table to administer this. However, the USA does not enter the war during the production phase. Instead, place their blocks on the turn track when they enter the war. Then, at the start of every Allied action phase, move the blocks from the track to the game board from that turn to any friendly controlled or friendly contested hex with a supply line. 
Now, if Koblenz or Paris deployment hexes are under enemy control, French blocks may deploy to any hex south or west of Paris. German blocks in any hex to the north or south of Koblenz. Now that we've talked about reinforcements, let's discuss attrition. Following deployment, each player will determine manpower attrition by rolling a six-sided die and consulting the attrition table. Attrition losses are taken from frontline hexes of the player's choice. A quick note, on turn 7, the allied player also adds 1 to their attrition results due to the French mutinies of 1917. After that, the next step in the production phase is to collect economic points. Players reference the same economy and reinforcements table to tell them how many economic points they can collect each turn. Economic points are represented by cubes. Blue cubes represent allied points and black cubes central powers points. The economic points will be spent on resources, but first they must survive naval warfare. For naval warfare, we will focus most of our attention on the naval warfare panel. Be aware though, some naval warfare results may impact the USA entry track as well. During World War I, both sides fought to control the flow of supplies in the Atlantic. The Allied powers used its navy to blockade enemy ports and cut off supplies from their enemies. The Central powers used German U-boats to target and destroy ships they believed to be benefiting the Allies. The Naval Warfare Panel and the Blue Draw Bag are Fields of Despair's way of abstracting the Royal Navy blockade and the German U-boat offensive. Cubes, drawn from the blue draw bag, tell players the results of events in the Atlantic, and the Naval Warfare Panel tracks the effectiveness of each side's tactics. A blue cube indicates an Allied blockade success, a black cube a U-boat success, a white cube means neither side scored a success. Successful draws always penalize the other side by removing at least one economic point per cube. The Naval Warfare Panel increases these penalties. Drawing at least one blue cube during a turn increases the blockade marker one space on the Naval Blockade track. Each space on the track increases the economic point penalty per cube drawn. Once unrestricted submarine warfare is declared, drawing at least one black cube during a turn increases the USW marker on the unrestricted submarine warfare track. This modifies the amount of strength point casualties that affect British blocks in England. Next, let's set up the Naval Warfare Panel in the blue draw bag and we'll walk through the steps to see how it works. For the introductory scenario, place the USW marker on Space Zero of the Unrestricted Submarine Warfare Track. Place the Blockade marker on Space One of the Naval Blockade Track. Next. Take the blue draw bag and place five blue cubes, three black cubes, and one white cube inside it. During subsequent production phases, players have the option to pay economic points to add more cubes. However, once the game begins, the contents of the blue draw bag are secret and never revealed to the public. Next, we're going to walk through the steps to conduct naval warfare. In the first step, the Central Powers player declares their submarine strategy. They may declare prize regulations or unrestricted submarine warfare. These choices are based on history. With prize regulations, German U-boats allowed crews to safely leave their merchant vessels before they were sunk. With unrestricted submarine warfare, U-boats sunk merchant shipping without warning. Obviously, this tactic didn't go over well with neutral powers like the United States. Once the Central Powers player decides their submarine tactic, they then draw three cubes from the blue draw bag. We're going to keep our example from earlier to show one of each color and the impacts. In the next step, it's time to determine economic losses. Remember, a blue cube equals an allied blockade success, a black cube a central powers U-boat success, and a white cube means that no naval event occurred. First, with an allied blockade success, 
each blue cube drawn means the central powers loses one economic point. The allied player also gets to add additional central powers penalty from the naval blockade track. Whatever space the blockade marker is on, add the economic point penalty shown on the space. Once penalties have been assessed on the central powers player, advance the blockade marker by one space. Then it's time to assess any economic losses from black cubes that are drawn. For the central powers, whether they declared prize regulations or unrestricted submarine warfare, this step is the same. For each black cube drawn, the allied powers lose one economic point. Pretty simple. The next step is resolved only if unrestricted submarine warfare is declared. First, the unrestricted submarine warfare track marker is moved the number of spaces equal to the black cubes drawn. Then, referencing the USW table, the Central Powers player will roll a six-sided die and compare it with the number beneath the USW marker. This result will tell the Allied player the number of British strength points to remove immediately in England. Now, unrestricted submarine warfare can cause the USA to enter the war sooner. The first time the Central Powers declare unrestricted submarine warfare, advance the US entry marker one space on its track. Also, if two black cubes are drawn, and then there is a die result of six, advance the US entry marker one space. And for the final step of naval warfare, players return cubes to the blue draw bag, except for any white cubes. These are removed from the game. In step five, players finally get to spend their economic points. Let's take a look at what they can buy. Players may spend their economic point cubes on the following items. Each item typically costs one economic point each. However, there are some limitations. Several investments can be made in the player board, so let's look at those first. Economic points can be spent to increase the maintenance tracks. This includes the artillery and aircraft maintenance tracks, as well as the supply capacity track. Players may also advance technology tracks for aircraft, poison gas, gas masks, and tanks for the Allies or Staatstruppen for the Central Powers. Players can also purchase up to three logistic points, make Belgian bribes, if playing with those optional rules, or purchase tank or Staatstruppen breakout tiles. A player can also spend economic points to upgrade their artillery. Artillery strength can be upgraded one point per level up to level four, or a new level one artillery tile can be added to a maximum of six tiles in play. Finally, remember that up to three unspent economic points can be rolled over until the next turn. Economic points can also be spent to make changes on the game board. One economic point can be spent to convert an infantry block to a cavalry block. For one economic point, up to four infantry strength points may be replaced by cavalry strength points. Cavalry blocks must be available in the force pool to make this exchange. Players are limited to one of these upgrades per turn. Also, an economic point can be spent to repair a damaged fortress. One point of repair per fortress is allowed per turn. Next, economic point cubes can be added to draw bags. For the red eastern front draw bag, the central powers player can add up to two black cubes. For the blue naval warfare draw bag, the central powers player can add up to two black cubes, and the allied player can add up to three blue cubes. If playing with the optional British neutrality rules and Britain is neutral, this is limited to one blue cube. Finally, players can use economic point cubes to bid for initiative. Let's look at that next. When bidding for initiative, players secretly place any economic point cubes they wish to bid in their hand. Then both players simultaneously reveal what they're holding. The player with the higher bid wins the initiative and goes first during each action phase until such time as the initiative changes again. All economic points used in a bid, win or lose, are considered spent. A tie bid does not change initiative. 
And as you can see, this is step six in the production phase sequence. And after that, the final step is to allocate supply. We talked all about supply in the last episode. At this time, players allocate supply to hexes that contain their blocks. The number of hex spaces with blocks that can be supplied is indicated by the supply capacity track on the player board. At the beginning of the introductory scenario, each player can supply 17 hexes. Of course, this assumes the player has spent one economic point to offset economic maintenance. When the scenario begins, players only have blocks in 10 hex spaces. There is more than enough supplies to cover this. Later in the game, if supplies run low, or if blocks are cut off behind enemy lines, use out of supply markers to keep track of those spaces. And with step 7 complete, that finishes off the production phase sequence. Next, since we've already covered the action phase in the first episode of this series, we're going to move on to the strategic reorganization phase. Players use strategic reorganization to transfer the strength points of their armies over longer distances than normally allowed to better position them for offensive or defensive operations in the coming turn. Transferring strength points does not have to mean physically moving blocks, although players can. Instead, a player may simply reduce the strength points of a block in one hex and increase them in another. The amount of strength points that may be moved in this phase is not governed by a specific number. However, factors like supply, length of the front line, and blocks available in a player's force pool may limit movement. The following rules set these parameters. Both players complete strategic reorganization simultaneously, but the player with initiative may make any final adjustments. Blocks and hexes must both be in supply and have supply lines connecting them to participate in this phase. Every frontline hex that began with a block must end this phase with at least one block. Deception blocks may be moved in this phase and may replace a block to meet the previous rule. The total strength points in play may never change. The allied player cannot mix the strength points of their various nationalities. They must keep them separate. And finally, at the end of this phase, no hex may contain more than three blocks of their side. Now, let's look at a brief example I've recreated from the rulebook. In this example, the Central Powers player wishes to strategically reorganize their forces. They have an infantry block with a strength of 16, they would like to redistribute some of these strength points up their front line. Therefore, they take one strength point, rotate their block down to 15, and place that point in the 6 strength block, making it a 7 strength block. They then take two additional strength points off that 15 strength block, therefore making it a 13 strength block, and reassign those points to their 2 strength block, making it a 4 strength block. Finally, they move their deception block to create a greater show of strength at the top of their front line. Remember, this example is only showing the Central Powers side of strategic reorganization. The Central Powers player cannot see the strength of the allied player's blocks as they move them at the same time. By shifting forces in this way, players can reinforce weak areas of their defense and intensify the fog of war. At long last, we've reached the end of the sequence of play with the scoring phase. For this phase, following the setup for the introductory scenario, each player places their victory point marker on space zero of the general information track. Now, to learn how to score victory points and win the game, we must consult the eligible conditions for a specific scenario in the playbook. The victory conditions for the introductory scenario are shown at the bottom of page 10. Victory conditions come in three types. The decisive victory is based on capturing specific locales. For the Central Powers player, 
they need to capture Paris and hold it until the end of an Allied action phase. For the Allied powers, if they can remove all Central Powers blocks from hex spaces in France after the end of turn 2, then they win the game. The second type is a domination victory. If either power's victory points exceed the other by 6 or more, that player wins the game. Finally, the game can be won by total victory points. If neither player achieves a decisive or domination victory, the player with the highest score following turn 3 wins. If the score is tied, the game is a draw. Now, let's discuss how to earn victory points. The methods are shown on page 11, but it's easier to understand this if we look at the map. The Central Powers victory point objectives are as follows. First, there are permanent victory points that can be scored every turn. The Central Powers player may score one victory point every scoring phase for control of every hex containing a CP-VP banner. They may also score one victory point for hexes on the River Marne that are controlled or contested. Once scored, these victory points may never be lost. There are also one-time victory points that can be scored one time and may be lost. The Central Powers player scores one victory point for any hex in Belgium with a CPVP banner on a turn in which control is gained. Each of these hexes may never add more than one VP each to the CPVP total. Once scored, the VP for a hex is lost if it is controlled by the allies during a subsequent scoring phase. Lost VPs may be reacquired with CP control of the hex in a subsequent scoring phase. For the allied victory point objectives, let's look at the permanent victory points that can be scored every scoring phase. Score one victory point for every scoring phase for control of every hex containing a Plan 17 marker. Once scored, these VP may never be lost. Score two victory points every scoring phase for control of every hex containing an allied VP banner. Once scored, these VPs may never be lost. There are also one-time victory points. These may be scored one time and then may be lost. The Central Powers player scores one victory point for control of a hex in Belgium with a CPVP banner. If A, they control the hex gained in the current turn, and B, if the Central Powers previously scored VP for controlling the hex. Once scored, the VP may be lost if it is controlled by the CP during a subsequent scoring phase. The Allied Powers may score one of the following at the end of turn 3 based on the number of hexes in France controlled by the Central Powers. If the Central Powers control 12 to 14 hexes, then the Allied Powers score 1 victory point. 9 to 11 hexes, 2 victory points. Less than or equal to 8 hexes, 3 victory points. And now that we've covered off on victory points, you should be ready to begin your own game of Fields of Despair by GMT Games. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.